Hello, my beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleedin Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, soul mentoring, and a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. And I invite you to learn more about my offerings at my website, illuminatingsouls.com. You can also visit me at my Facebook page of the same name. And I also have a daily inspiration email blast where I send you an inspiring message every weekday, and you can sign up for that at my website as well. So lots of ways we can connect. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you come into a state of relaxation, restfulness, and Sleep, if that is your intention. And I say that because I know there are many of you that listen to the podcast in your waking hours, when you're commuting or creating or going for your walk. And so however you are guided to listen to this podcast, I am grateful for this opportunity to keep you company. So this podcast is an unlikely mashup of two of my favorite forms of self-care, connecting with the angels and sleep podcasts. You know, I didn't even realize what I was creating when I created this. I just knew that I wanted to do a sleep podcast because I have been listening to them for years and I love them so much. And I wanted to add my voice to the voices that are lulling people to sleep because what I found was I was always looking for different sleep podcasts because I might want something different one night than I did the next. And so I got really excited about the idea of doing a sleep podcast. And then I thought, well, if I'm going to do a sleep podcast. I really should bring in the angels. I mean, that's what I'm known for. And my audience, you know, the people who've been a part of the Illuminating Souls family forever might think it odd that I would do a podcast without angels. So, okay, I'll bring in the angels and, and voila, <laughs> Sleepy Bedtime Blessings was born. It really doesn't make much sense, this mashup that I'm doing, unless you are a part of our soul family, right? You like the Earth Girl stuff, <laughs> where we talk about television and schoolgirl crushes and favorite recipes, and the angels, Because isn't that a lovely blend that it truly reflects who I am? And if you're listening, I lovingly reflect that. Perhaps it also reflects who you are, a beautiful divine being having a very human experience. So this podcast is for your divine self and your human self. So welcome to the family. (laughs) Glad you're here. I love looking at the statistics for the podcast, not because of the numbers, because at this point, 
we have a, a rather intimate audience, which is lovely because I feel like I know each one of you, even if we have never met. But I love to see all the cities and countries represented in our listenership. So wherever you are listening from, I am so grateful to spend this time with you. And I do have a small request that if you are enjoying the podcast, if you would consider leaving a review on iTunes, really helps others discern whether or not this is the podcast for them. So thank you in advance for leaving a review. And if you've already left one, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. It's hard to believe that we are getting ready to close in on our hundredth episode. This is either episode 97 or 98. You know, it's so weird. I just looked this up before I started recording and already it has floated out of my head because I'm so tuned into this beautiful angelic vibe that is flowing through for you. So let me set the stage. It is early morning here in the Bay Area, when I came underneath the blanket fort, it was still dark outside. The sun will likely have come up by the time I'm done recording this. I feel a sweet sense of calm coming in for us all. And it feels so welcoming. And I describe this energy to you so you can begin imagining it, attuning to it, experiencing it in whatever way works best for you. But there is sweet, soothing energy flowing through for you right now. The angels want you to know that they are hearing your prayers and they are supporting you and loving you with every breath. And so I'm going to call them in even though they are already here. I love the ritual of asking them to be with us so that you know that they are with us as well. So beautiful angels on high, I invite you to be with us now. I ask that you bring to each one of our beloveds listening signs of magic, waves of love, and sparks of inspiration to support them on their journey. So dear ones, I just invite you to take a few nice deep breaths in as this love flows to you. As some of you know, sometimes when the angelic energy flows in, I get this surge of heat (laughs) moving through me and just when I started the prayer, I felt the heat rising up. So if any of you are feeling a bit extra toasty right now, it's okay. It'll move through. It's a way that the angels come in and clear the energy field. You know, in our day-to-day life, it is so easy to forget who we are. We succumb to the day-to-day ordinariness of life. Not that there's anything wrong with ordinariness. It's lovely to have a reliable rhythm to our days. But we forget about our magic. We forget about our creativity. And you know, we're all creative. It's just that we judge ourselves as not because Somewhere in our adult life, we have linked creativity with mastery. 
But as creator beings, right, we are made in the image of the divine. And it doesn't mean that the divine is human. (laughs) It means that we are also creator or creative beings. We have imaginations. We see the world through new eyes every day. We can witness the beauty of an ordinary moment. And so there is this creative spirit that dwells within you. It is a part of you. It comes with each of our original operating systems. So I affirm that if you would like for your creative spirit to open, that the angels are helping you with this. It's one of my favorite ways to co-create is to give myself space to see a situation through new eyes. To let it be okay if I don't have the answer. To open up to a sense of curiosity. To wander through my thoughts and my imagination and see what flows to me. This world is a beautiful place and filled with wonderful experiences for you. So take a deep breath in and release and allow the goodness to flow to you now. There's nothing you need to do. Simply receive the love that is here for you. This love is helping you to open to even more of your authentic self. And as I bring this message forward for you, I'm starting to get the tingles at the top of my crown chakra, which is always a sure sign. The angels are here and bringing a beautiful download of love forward for you. You are magical. You are precious. Allow the light within you to shine brightly because it is your truth that you are a beloved of this universe and that you carry the wisdom of the ages in your heart and just breathe with us. And if you are Getting ready for sleep. Just let your body grow heavy. You have done enough for this day and now it is your time to rest. Just allow a wave of relaxation to flow from the top of your head, down your neck, down your shoulders and your torso. Down your lower back, down your thighs, to your feet, just allowing your whole body to sink into a loving state of rest. Right now the angels are bringing to you a soft pink light that is filled with divine love for you. This wave of love can expand throughout your household if you would like it to, so that it envelops everything with love. It bathes everything with love. And just let this love do all the heavy lifting for you. Because what might feel heavy to you is light 
as a feather to your angels. So take a breath and release that which is not yours that you do not need to carry. And if you're not sure what that is, just let the angels clear it from you. And as I share these messages with you, I have to say I feel such a profound wave of hopefulness coming through. That even if life feels a bit heavy now, please do not lose your hope of brighter tomorrows. There is goodness flowing for you now. Take a breath in and as you rest, the angels will help to raise your vibration, to help lighten your energy field. Just imagine your energy field growing lighter and lighter, growing higher and higher as you connect more deeply with your authentic spirit, with the brightness of your soul, and with the joy of your heart. Just breathe with us now and let the angels take good care of you. And I'm going to take a big deep breath with you as well. I feel such deep gratitude flowing through for you. The angels honor you for your journey, for whatever brought you to this moment. This moment is one that is steeped in much love for you. The angels honor your journey. They honor the healing you have been moving through. They honor you for your prayers. They honor you for the way You help take care of those you love. The angels honor you. You are a blessing in this world. And you are made of light. You are born of stars. So you breathe. And let the love come streaming into you. You can drift off whenever you are ready. And while you rest, I'm going to tell you a story. So this episode is being published on October 30th. So how could this episode be about anything other than Halloween memories? But I promise you, it's not going to be spooky or scary. And I say that because several of the sleep podcasts I listen to often will use this holiday as an opportunity to share some of the spookier stories, which is not what I love. I mean, listen, we're friends now, right? You've been listening to this podcast for a while. You have to know that as a kid, my favorite part about Halloween was candy, right? (laughs) Come on. Greatest holiday ever. You get to go to people's houses and ask for candy and they give it to you. So my Halloween memories are going to be very candy centric. Um, I don't eat sugar anymore, so I just bask in the afterglow of many years of joyful Halloween candy consumption (laughs) and and the wonderment of the holiday as a child. So we're going to be spending a lot of time there. So I grew up in Skokie, Illinois, and my key childhood Halloween years would have taken place between the late 60s and early 70s. And at the time, 
our perception of life was that it was really safe to be a kid. You know, much of my childhood was spent running around without parental supervision, not because our parents didn't care, but because our parents sort of knew where we were. We lived on a block with lots of other kids. We kind of all grew up together and we banded about and went on adventures and bike rides and we played in each other's basements. And so we were often in a group of kids. So while my mom might not know whose house I was in, she she had a pretty good chance of figuring out where I was by the process of elimination. So it feels to me in retrospect that we had a lot more freedom back then than kids do today. So by the time I was old enough to go trick-or-treating without my parents, I would say I was probably seven or eight years old. And I went with other kids, so it wasn't that we were all alone. And so when I think back to the Halloween of my childhood, I also think back to the costumes. So the costumes of yesteryear are nothing like what they are now. You know, now there's this thing called safety that somehow is (laughs) important, which I understand why it is. I'm being facetious here. But in my day, a costume would come with this plastic mask. It, it just covered, it covered your face, but not the back of your head, just the front of your head. And it was made of hard plastic. It was like pressed plastic. So if it was a clown, it looked like a clown's face. If it was a princess, it looked like a princess's face. And it had two little slits for the eyes and a little hole cut out for the mouth. I don't even know that there was anything for the nose. And there was this tiny elastic band that went around the back. And so you would put it over your face. Now, I think the reason these got discontinued as well they should have been is because you couldn't really see out of them. There was zero peripheral vision. And, you know, if you're a kid on a candy quest, you're not worried about peripheral vision. You are profoundly focused on getting to the next house and the one after that, right? So we had these masks and also they smelled badly and they would get hot and sweaty because you really could not breathe well. I think the hole for the mouth was simply a hint of of what you should be doing. (laughs) And then there typically was some kind of plastic sheet printed with a costume that you would tie around, you know, the back of your neck and your waist and your legs. So really not at all as cool as today's costumes for kids. But they were our costumes and we loved them. Now, the thing about having Halloween in Chicago was always, almost always, By October 31st, it was cold and you had to wear a coat, which was really a drag because here you had this, what we thought was a cool costume, which was not really cool, but we thought it was back then. And you had to put your ordinary muggle winter coat over it, which ruined the whole effect. But we got over that because there was a holy quest for candy involved. So we would do whatever we had to do to get the candy, right? Like, okay, if I have to put on my coat, I will. There's candy involved. Regarding costumes, I do know at some point our mom made at least my sister and I costumes. I don't know that she made one for our brother. I don't know that he would have been interested at that point. But my costume was a clown costume. She bought the pattern at 
whoever the, I, who, I'm trying to remember who the, what the, the fabric store was. I can see them. Um, for anyone who's from Skokie, it was the fabric store that used to be at Costner and Tui that later became Hancock Fabric. And she got a Butterick pattern for a clown costume that was brightly colored because it was the 70s. And I put my hair in a braid and I braided it around a coat hanger so that my braid stuck out like Pippi Longstocking. (laughs) And then that meant that I got to wear face makeup, which was a big deal. So that was my first memory of having a costume that didn't require one of those plastic masks. But I digress because we're really all about the candy, right? That's where we need to go here. So my recollection was we would go trick-or-treating with some of the neighborhood kids. My sister and I would. Now, I, I need to make a really interesting reflection to you about my memories All of our memory systems work a bit differently. Mine tend to get blended together into an archetypal memory, unless it's a really important one. Whereas for other people, the memories exist singularly, and it's like they're going through a mental Rolodex. Temple Grandin has an amazing TED talk about this, but, but that's a whole other topic. But watching her TED talk makes me realize how my memory system works. So when I go back to my childhood trick-or-treating days, I see myself with kids from the block, my sisters for sure with me. My mom would have never let me go trick-or-treating without her, and I of course would take her. And I see other kids, but the kid who I always see in the memories is our next door neighbor, Jimmy. So, Jim, if you're listening, hello. (laughs) So, Jimmy was our next door neighbor. And he was a kid who had a tremendous sense of adventure. He was always willing to try something new. And you know what's interesting as an adult is I look back at my life and I recognize how wonderful it is to have friends who are willing to stretch the rules a bit. Like, I had great adventures with him and so for some reason I always see him in my memory with us as we're trick-or-treating. So to my other friends of that age who lived on the block with me, it's not that you weren't there, but for some reason that's what I always remember. And there's another key Halloween memory that involves Jimmy and our other friends from the neighborhood that I will get to. So imagine, if you will, that it's already dark out because I seem to recall that we would go trick-or-treating after four or five o'clock. There was something about waiting until people were done with their dinner uh, and, and that people were home from work. And back then, many families just had one person working or one car. That's just the generation we grew up in. I'm not saying that two, two, you know, both parents worked, but, but that's what I seem to recall. We had to wait for people to get home from work and have their dinner, and then we could go out. And we had strategies. We would be strategizing for Halloween for weeks before it happened. So it would be dark out, would probably be cold, so it would involve a coat. It would be a, we would carry a bag or a pumpkin, and then we would start hitting up the neighborhood And we would walk for blocks and blocks going up and down. And, you know, you would pass other kids on the block. And so you would play this game of telephone about who had the best candy, 
right? Like make sure you hit up that house two blocks up with a yellow light. They're giving out full-size Snicker bars. And, you know, any kid worth their salt, you knew you had to change up your strategy quickly if full-size candy bars were involved. And then there would be those houses that would give out the pennies, right? Like, wah, wah. <laughs> and you could skip those because no one really wanted a penny. You wanted the goods, right? Who cared about a penny? And so we would march up and down each street for what seemed like hours. Maybe it was, I don't know. But we would get as much candy as we could. And and we had a curfew of some kind. Like I knew that we had to be home at some point. But the strategy was to go up one block and down the next. And we would keep looking into our bags or our pumpkins as they got bigger and bigger. And, you know, nowadays we know more about children and sugar consumption. So, you know, parents tell kids not to eat the candy while they're trick-or-treating. Well, that was not the case in my day. We ate a lot of candy as we trick-or-treated. Of course we did. You know, at the age stage, I remember there were no parents. And, you know, there was always that urban legend about the parents have to check the candy or or the apple, the urban legend of the apple that had something sharp in it. So don't eat the apple until your parents could check it. Like, I don't know who, who got that message circulating, but I promise you, kids who are trick-or-treating, no kid is choosing to eat the unknown apple before the Snicker bar. So there was always this urban legend about not eating the apple before your parents could check it. And I was like, no problem. First off, I don't think anyone ever gave me an apple. And I was perfectly contented chewing on a Tootsie Roll (laughs) or M&Ms, which were very hard to tamper with in the day. So we would go up and down all the blocks We were, I think, two blocks away from Lincolnwood, which was the next city over. So sometimes we would go up into Lincolnwood and then come back down into Skokie and find our way home. And so now we get home with our goods. And again, I seem to recall now parents are much more strict about the consumption of Halloween candy, right? You can have two pieces I don't remember my mother ever laying down such rules for us because I would remember that because good luck, good luck getting between me and my Halloween candy. Are you kidding? I have waited the entire year for this glorious moment in time where strangers give me candy, (laughs) lots of it. And it's a huge assortment of candy because I never really met a candy I wouldn't eat. Like I eat, I would eat any candy. If it was sugar, I would eat it. I mean, how many of you remember the candy necklaces? You know, with those little discs of pressed sugar that were beads? Like I would wear that and sweat (laughs) in my candy necklace And I would still snack on it during the day. Like sweat neck candy. Good to go. (laughs) Sorry. That just cracks me up. Like just, just innocuously snapping off a piece of candy as I go about my day. I just thought that was a super cool invention. But I digress. Let's go back to Halloween, shall we? So, Now we're home with our Halloween stash. And now comes the great process of sorting our candy, which was serious business. So 
I had a hierarchy for candy. And let me share with you what it is. You start off with your tier one candy, which was anything that was a Snickers. Well, first off, the platinum level was any full-sized candy bar. And here it didn't matter if it was like a second tier chocolate, like a Butterfinger or a first tier chocolate, like a Snickers. If it was full size, it was platinum. Okay, then we get to tier one. For me, the tier ones were the Snickers, the Milky Ways, the M&Ms. And, and I'll say the, um, the Three Musketeers. I, I, a Three Musketeer aside, when I was dieting, which is most of my adult life, when I still ate sugar, I would sometimes get the Three Musketeers because it was lower in calories and you got more <laughs> because it was lighter weight. I didn't know this as a kid, though. As a kid, the Three Musketeers to me had value because they were good frozen. See, some candies were good at room temperature and others took on a whole other experience when they were frozen. So the tier ones were all of the really good chocolate. Tier two were the other chocolates that were still good, but not my favorite. So that would be like Clark bars. What is it? The hundred grand, um, butter fingers. I would definitely eat those, but they weren't necessarily tier one. They were like tier two chocolates. Tier three was non-chocolate items. So if you think about things like dots, remember the jelly dots? And and just so you know, I know that things like nerds and gummy bears fit into this category, but they did not exist in my childhood. So they are not part of my Halloween memory bank. So I am not speaking of them. I'm going to be very authentic to my Halloween experience. So the tier three non-chocolate items would be things like the dots. And let me tell you, those were always the last thing I ate because who wanted those? Who cared? I didn't. I know other people like them, but this was, this is, these are my Halloween memories. So, um, I don't know how many of you remember the chuckles. Those were the big jelly rectangles that would be in a long tube thing. Um, there would be things like Smarties, which unfortunately are not the awesome chocolate Smarties that exist in the UK and Europe and Canada. Our Smarties were like tart sugar pressed candies. There were sweet tarts, always lots of sweet tarts were given out in Halloween. Um, we also had things like Good and Plenty. I was that weird kid who liked licorice. So I still do, even though I don't eat it anymore. Good and Fruity. Lemon Heads. Remember the Lemon Heads in the little boxes? Red Hots, the little boxes of Red Hots. Um, Boston B- Baked Beans, the candies. All of that would be tier three. So I would eat those, but those were better for trading. Like I didn't, they weren't my favorite. And typically I would be getting kind of sad when I would get to that part of my candy stash. I would say fourth tier would be the taffies, the the real taffy kinds of things. That would include things like Mary Jane's those sort of peanut butter honey things, a bit of honey. How many of you remember the bullseyes? Those were the caramels with the little cream in the center. Um, and my sister just reminded me of the orange wrapped and black, black wrapped peanut butter taffies. 
And she was laughing because she and her husband remembered how disgusting they were. And I loved them. Again, I did not have a discerning palate when it came to sugar. (laughs) I was like, sugar with a little bit of peanut butter? Sign me up. Let's go. And, and my sister's discernment of Halloween candy versus my love of every Halloween candy is going to come into play in just a moment. So bear with me. I also need to share about um, the miscellaneous candy, which is worthy of its own category, which would be candy corn. And of course, I know, you know this by now, I loved candy corn. Loved it. Yum. I know some people think it's disgusting. Love it. I really loved the autumn mix, which had the candy corn with the brown tops, which were chocolatey. And I also loved those giant honkin' orange pumpkins that came in the autumn mix. So anything candy corn, I was in. My sister reminded me of the popcorn balls which I had completely forgotten about, but who now remembers the Halloween popcorn balls. And I decided that Tootsie Rolls were worthy of being in this category because they're both a chocolate and a taffy. And I have always loved a good Tootsie Roll. Loved them. And when they came out with the flavored Tootsie Rolls, I never liked the the, the fruit ones, but I loved the vanilla ones. So I'm going to put Tootsie Rolls in that special category. And then at the bottom of the barrel was, again, as I mentioned, the apple, which no one was going to ever eat. And I don't even know that anyone ever gave them out. And pennies, because why? Just why with pennies? And as a sad aside, there was a time in life when we had no trick-or-treaters coming. And I think I maybe had a little bit of candy, but not enough and gave quarters, which probably in the 2000s was akin to getting a penny. So I became the penny lady, even though I was giving out quarters. I was very embarrassed for myself. Yes, I judged myself harshly for giving out quarters. Because I remembered how much I despised the pennies, because I would have rather had a box of good and plenty for sure. Okay, so now the candy is sorted because now the bargaining begins. Now my sister reminded me, I didn't remember this until she told me, as much as I loved almost all food, my sister was profoundly picky in what she ate and she only liked the plain chocolate. Oh wait, I have to go back because I have forgotten a candy that I have to throw into the other chocolate category, um, malted milk balls, whoppers. And here's why I'm going to throw those in. There were only certain candies that my sister found value in, and that would have been the plain Hershey bars, the plain M&Ms, the whoppers, the Tootsie Rolls, I think she liked. But so she had a smaller subset of candy that she valued. And so after we sorted our candy, we then traded. Because who wanted plain chocolate when you could have a Snickers, right? That was my philosophy. So we traded candy, and then we had our respective stashes. The thing about my sister is she had much more inherent control over how she ate her candy. And at some point... In the early weeks of November, my candy stash would be depleted and hers would still exist somewhere. My mom would sort of put away the candies that she didn't like so much. And I think every single one of us in that house went into her stash to get reinforcements. I remember, I don't know if this was every year, but I seem to recall it lived in the cabinet next to the stove, the lower cabinet. And I would remember trying to be very stealthy and going into her stash 
and picking one or two things thinking no one would notice. And I'm sure everyone knew it because probably they were doing it too. And there was also a subset of our stash that would get frozen. And I remember that my mother loved frozen Milky Ways and Snickers and Three Musketeers. So our stash was shared. I I definitely shared my stash and my sister did. So our stashes went far and wide. And I have to tell you about one of the coolest things we ever did regarding our stashes and trading candy. And this gets back to our neighbor, Jimmy, who lived next door. So Jimmy had this brilliant idea that we should run a rope, a string between our houses, that our dining room windows were right across from each other. I mean, there was, there was, there was a a lot of yard separating us. It wasn't like an apartment building where you can reach out and touch your neighbor. There was an expanse of lawn between our homes. But he had this brilliant idea that we should run a rope between our homes. And then we could trade candy back and forth. So we would tape the candy to the rope and he would pull it to his house. And then he would tape something to the rope and we would pull it to our house. And we would trade candy this way. And if you're a kid, this is a brilliant idea. And so we did that for hours. And then if a piece of candy dropped, I just remember Jimmy would run around the house or sometimes he would even jump out the window and get the candy and hand it over. And we loved trading our stuff because someone would send something across and then you had to discern what would be a reciprocal trade, right? If someone is sending across two mini packets of M&Ms, what were you going to trade in return? It had to be good. Honor was at stake. So this was a really fun game. We all, we were always coming up with games like this, especially Jimmy. He always had the best imagination for these things. And then we had to one-up it. Our other friends in the neighborhood caught wind of this, and now we were going to up the ante. And so I don't know where we got a rope this long, I have no memory of that, but surely we must have raided some parents' workbench. But we ran a rope from the second floor of the front bedroom of Jimmy's house across the street, catty corner, to our other friend's house, their side window on the second floor. I think it was one of the girls' bedrooms. And we started trading candy across the block, like across the street. (laughs) And so we would have to be on the phone so we knew when to pull the rope. And so, you know, someone would be like, I'm sending a Snickers over. And we would pull on the rope. And across the street, this Snickers would be flying, (laughs) not flying, going slowly, but hovering above the street as we pulled it across to the other house. And, and then we would have to send something back. And so then the next candy would get pulled back across the street, hovering from second floor to second floor across the street. And every once in a while, of course, a piece of candy would fall off and one of us kids would have to dash out to get it from the middle of the street. But before you worry that this was super dangerous, maybe one car every 20 minutes came up and down our street. It was not busy like it was, you know, life was different then. Typically households had one car that the Typically, it was the husband who would take it to work. Um, so it wasn't as if there was a lot of traffic. And, and we knew to look out for cars. 
but that definitely was a game that kept us entertained for hours. And that will always be a part of my joyful Halloween memories was tr the trading of our candy by rope through our windows across the street. So if any of my friends from my childhood who were participating in that with us, if you remember it, let me know because it is one of my happy, joyful memories of Halloween. It will always be associated with Halloween for me. So Halloween was awesome because it involved sugar. I also have to say as I got older, Halloween didn't have as much mystique for me. Although I do remember in the 80s, repurposing an old bridesmaid's dress. So again, so think of the, the fashion of the 80s. Everything was extra. Everything was extra. And I had a bridesmaid's dress that was pink. It, it had a sweetheart cut neckline. It had tulle and netting and it was bright bubblegum pink and it had netted sleeves like pink netted sleeves which was in fashion back then and I spent a lot of money on this dress right bridesmaids dresses weren't cheap even back then and I decided for Halloween to repurpose it as a tooth fairy dress <laughs> so I got a crown and I got a giant toothbrush from a novelty store of some kind. And so for many years, I went as the tooth fairy for Halloween. So I got my money's worth out of that dress. As an adult now, I don't get giddy about Halloween, except in this way. I have to, sh I can't do this episode and not share with you about one of my dear friends, David, who I know listens to the podcast. So David, this is for you. My friend David loves Halloween. He would live in year round Halloween if that was an option. Like Halloween is his most favorite time of year. He loves haunted houses he loves traveling to different haunts. He loves horror movies. He loves everything associated with Halloween. And so I live Halloween now vicariously through him. That when the Halloween decorations come out in August, my heart gets happy because I know he's happy. <laughs> Isn't that the most wonderful thing when you have someone in your life who enjoys something and you can enjoy it because they do. So David, I just, I can't do a Halloween episode and not give you a shout out and thank you for all the years you have brought Halloween love to me because of how much you love this time of year. So I hope all of you have a friend like that who loves Halloween so much, or maybe you love Halloween this much, right? Halloween is one of those holidays where it becomes hopefully for you easier. Like I'm hoping you don't have really bad Halloween memories, you know, but it's one of those holidays that can just bring a tremendous amount of joy. And if you're wondering what our Halloween plans are this year. So, so if you've been listening, you know, I go to bed really early, right? Like I'm ready for bed at eight o'clock. I have become the old crabby lady who wants to turn off the porch light. I am so sorry, but that has become me. <laughs> if trick-or-treaters would come at nine in the morning, I'd be fine. But I did buy the biggest bag of candy I have ever seen from Costco. Perhaps you bought the same one. It's the one with all of the tier one chocolates, right? The Snickers and the Milky Ways and the M&Ms. It was 1899 and I think it has 150 pieces of candy. And we don't get many trick-or-treaters anymore here, so we should have plenty. And whatever we don't give out, my husband will take to work with him because I have finally reached my place 
in my consciousness where it is easy for me to be around candy and I don't feel like I need to eat it. So I will be consuming zero Halloween candy this year, but I have eaten enough for five lifetimes that I can go into my memories and still taste it. I have the joy of eating hundreds of pounds, I'm sure, of Halloween candy. And wait, I have one more thing to share. I was also always that person when I worked in an office that I had the pumpkin filled with Halloween candy for, air quotes, my friends. <laughs> like, like it was the one time of year that I got to put candy on my desk, quote, for other people. <laughs> And it was, I was thrilled when people came by my office for some candy, but you know, it was so I could have it too, right? You you know that that generosity was all about also serving my own love of candy. (laughs) So if it was really for other people, I would probably have put candy in there I didn't like, so I wouldn't eat it. But I would always fill it up with the stuff I loved. And you know, I'm so, okay, so, so you're supposed to be asleep, so I'm not going to worry about being so scattered, but I have to remember a candy that just popped in my brain that I would often fill my pumpkin with, which is the Hershey Miniatures, which I always loved as an adult because you could have like five different kinds of candy instead of one. So I don't remember those much from my trick-or-treating days. But if we worked together in an office, my pumpkin would be filled with Tootsie Rolls because I always loved those and they lasted longer. Hershey's Miniatures. I don't know that I would get the Snickers at that point. I would for sure get some little candy corns because I loved those. Um, Hershey Kisses. Now, Hershey Kisses weren't good for trick-or-treaters because those could be quote, tampered with. I don't know who's doing that, but they weren't a good trick-or-treater candy, but they were really good for the work pumpkin. So my work pumpkin would have had Hershey Kisses in it as well. So just imagine you're going to stop by my virtual office, which doesn't really exist, and I will have a pumpkin with yummy candy for you. And if you don't eat candy, I'll give you a quarter. And then you can judge me harshly. It'll be okay. It's fine. We love each other. Life is good. (laughs) So I wish you a good Halloween. I hope you have wonderful memories. And if your memories are fuzzy or maybe they weren't good, I hope you can borrow some of mine and be in the joy of Halloween with me a holiday dedicated to candy. I know other people will say a holiday dedicated to scary stuff and spooky stuff and costumes, but I was all about the sugar, like a sugar holiday. Like people would just give me candy because I asked. It was my dream come true, really. What more could I have asked for? Ring a doorbell, you say trick or treat, and someone gives you candy. Life was beautiful. (laughs) It still is. And so even though I don't eat sugar anymore, my memories keep me warm at night. (laughs) So I love you very much. And I will imagine that our inner children will go trick or treating together and will get good goods get a good stash and then we'll trade. And I want to thank all of you from my childhood who contributed to my wonderful childhood memories and to my friends who have caused me to love Halloween all over again. So I love you very much, my friends. I wish you the sweetest of dreams. I am so grateful 
that you exist. I'm so grateful you are alive right now on this planet and we get to share this adventure together. Life is better because you're here and I love you. Even if we haven't met, I just know I love you. I know you are someone I would be delighted to go trick-or-treating with. So you rest well and the angels will watch over you and we'll connect again soon. And if for some reason you're still awake, you can queue up another episode. There are lots of them in the archives. So until the next time, be well and we'll talk again soon. Good night.